Hello and welcome to the introduction on how to use the slide navigation and interactive features in Storyline 360. At the top of the slide, you can see the module number, lesson number, and lesson name, indicating the current lesson. The player bar is located at the bottom of the screen. It includes the play pause button on the left, the seek bar that allows you to control the slide timeline by dragging it, and the replay button to restart the slide. You can adjust the volume by clicking on the speaker icon. To enable closed captions, simply press the CC button. You can also adjust the playback speed by clicking this button here. Additionally, there is a full-size screen option available by clicking the screen icon on the right-hand side. If you want to skip slides, there are two options available. The first option is to use the next or previous buttons located at the bottom right corner of the slide. You can navigate through the slides one by one using these buttons. The second option is to open the menu bar by clicking the highlighted icon at the top left corner. In the menu, you will find a list of slide sections. Note that the current slide will be highlighted whilst the slides you have already viewed are marked with ticks. By opening the menu bar, you can jump to any slide you wish to visit in this lesson. However, it is possible that some lessons may have this feature restricted until you have viewed the slides in the prescribed order. If you click on the transcript tab on the right side of the menu, you will have access to the transcript. To search for specific slides in the lesson, click on the magnifying glass icon and enter the keyword to initiate the search. If there are resources available for the lesson, you can easily access them by clicking the resources button at the top right corner. When a hand cursor appears on a slide, you can click it to jump to the corresponding timestamps. This feature allows you to quickly navigate to the mentioned points or highlighted sections on the timeline. If you would like to learn more about EIT's world leading education and training courses, click on the screen or visit us at our website. We look forward to supporting your professional development journey. From all of us at the Egler Institute of Technology, we wish you all the best for your studies. I'd like to warmly welcome you to the Project Planning Processes and Cost Estimating course. I'm Mark Egler and I'll be your instructor for the next hour. Over the past 20 years, I have been a project manager, program manager and chief engineer on a range of very large and complex defense projects, in Australia, the US, and the Middle East. One of the key lessons that I have learned over the years is that good project planning and cost estimating are essential for success. Good project planning is not easy, it is often very tedious, and relies on staff with sound experience and a good understanding of the technology being purchased. So, this course will introduce you to the key knowledge and skill areas needed to plan complex projects, often in an uncertain planning environment. In the first hour I will provide you with an introduction to project planning and cost estimating. The remainder of the course will drill down in more detail, and cover a range of important methods and techniques that you will need to use in your day-to-day -day work. Once again, welcome to the course, and I trust you enjoy the learning experience. During this introductory lesson, I am going to cover important aspects surrounding the definition of complex capability systems. This will be discussed in the context of the capability management and planning arrangements contained within the Defense Capability Manual, and described as the One Defense Capability Model, and the One Defense Capability Phases. To simplify things a little, I will often refer to this as the capability life cycle. During the course I will discuss and highlight the important activity points and milestones that rely on the outputs of project planning, and occur as part of Gate 0, 1 and 2 work effort. You will be introduced to the key terminology used throughout the course, and also the key capability proposal related documents generated during the capability system design process. I will also spend some time providing an overview of the key foundations and cornerstone elements associated with project planning and cost estimating. I will finish off with a light-hearted discussion about the key role the desk officer performs 
during project planning and generating the key capability proposal documents. And to wrap up the introduction, I will provide you with a high-level overview of the course modules. So what is a capability? Various definitions can be found by exploring the multitude of references easily accessible on the internet. Wikipedia describes capability as the ability to perform certain actions or achieve certain outcomes. And this definition is somewhat extended by the Oxford Dictionary as the power or ability to do something. But both of these definitions are not sufficient for use in the military context. The ADF definition says that capability is the power to achieve a desired operational effect, in a nominated operating environment within a specific time, and to sustain that effect for a designated period. The military definition introduces three important additional factors. The first one relates to the capability effect being delivered in a particular operational environment, which can be either in the land, sea, or air domain. And it also introduces two temporal constraints relating to delivering the capability effect within a specified time, and then being able to sustain that effect over a set period. Another way to look at capability is through the acronym known as E-squared T-squared. This stands for effect, environment, and two temporal elements covering, notice to move and operational viability period. But how do we deliver capability? Let's now take a few moments to look at an example of an amphibious assault capability, to put some context around the definition. An amphibious assault capability, as you can see on this slide, is made up of a broad range of elements. Some of the elements occur within the primary system of interest. In this example the operational effect of amphibious assault is delivered by a combination of major systems, that include landing craft, armored vehicles, air support, dismounted infantry and a beach landing reconnaissance team. The mission system in this situation is delivered by these five elements. But there are also a range of elements external to the mission system. These are made up of things required to raise, train and sustain the amphibious assault capability, including external support systems covering maintenance and support infrastructure, various types of training, and a complex array of processes and procedures that deliver the required coordination and organizational relationships. You can also observe on the diagram, that elements within the mission system are therefore, dependent on external elements to make them viable. It is the totality of the system, which includes both the mission system, its support system, and the supporting external elements that constitutes the capability. Within the military we refer to this totality of internal and external systems as the fundamental inputs to capability. The design of complex military capability requires a systematic and comprehensive planning and capability design process that can confidently yield a capability system satisfying the user's operational need. So, capability systems comprise qualified personnel who use and maintain the system, a set of agreed processes providing for safe system operation, and a comprehensive set of physical systems engineered to satisfy user and other stakeholder needs. The capability system also requires an approved set of information and documents that exist within an agreed governance structure to command and manage the capability system. These elements are applicable to capability analysis covering the force in being, the planned force, and the future force. The capability design process is used to optimize these generic elements to maximize capability effects within a system's intended operational environment. Achieving this particular outcome requires team effort and close collaboration between both the capability and acquisition staff, supported by a deliberate and well-understood planning process. It is this planning process, supported by a range of other technical processes, such as systems engineering and integrated logistic support, that when successfully integrated, result in a coherent set of key capability proposal documents. Now that you have an understanding of the general elements constituting a capability, I will extend this model to the framework used within the capability life cycle. The totality of a capability systems is described using a model, 
as I explained earlier, called the fundamental inputs to capability. These inputs to capability comprise major systems, that includes all platforms, fleets of equipment and operating systems used to generate capabilities. Facilities and training areas that provide the necessary infrastructure to support the acquisition, sustainment and operation of the capability system. Support that is delivered by the integrated logistics support process during the acquisition phase of projects covering engineering support, maintenance support, supply support, training support, package handling storage and transport, facilities, support and test equipment, personnel, technical data and computer support. Supplies deliver the necessary classes of supply such as ammunition, water, and petrol oils and lubricants required to maintain a capability at a designated readiness state, and on operations. Command and management includes arrangements at all levels to safely and effectively employ the capability following introduction into service. Personnel covers the raising, training and sustaining a competent workforce across the ADF and public service. Organization provides for the flexible employment of capability within functional groupings that have an appropriate balance of competency, structure, and command and control to meet endorsed capability requirements. Collective training provides a defined collective training regime that validates performance levels against defense planning requirements. And industry includes, the consideration of the resilience and capacity of industry to meet the Australian Defence Forces peace and wartime requirements. Planning and designing capability systems, therefore requires the careful consideration of the nine FIC elements, as part of the capability systems design process. So, let me sum up what I have covered so far. You will recall that capability systems are created by aggregating the nine fundamental inputs to capability. All these inputs are significant, but generally speaking, it is the major systems that deliver the operational effects. Remember, it is the major systems comprising significant platforms and fleets of equipment, that individually comprise separate mission systems and support systems. Mission systems comprise those elements of the material system that directly perform the operational functions. And the support systems, comprise all the necessary hardware, software, facilities, personnel, data, processes, and services, that enable the mission system to deliver the required operational effects. So, it is the planning system that yields the key capability proposal documents, such as the business case, the project execution strategy, the operational concept document, and the function and performance specification, that are used to deliver the material system. The description and justification for the new or upgraded capability, is initially described by a joint capability needs statement. While the JCNS is considered the capstone document describing the new capability, it is the operational concept document, or OCD, that lays the essential foundations for the operational use and subsequent solution classes available to satisfy the operational need. The OCD is usually developed jointly, and concurrently, by the capability development staff and the acquisition organization. The resulting mission system delivered by the acquisition process is specified using a document called the Function and Performance Specification. It is often referred to as the FPS. And finally, the support system is described by a document known as the support system specification. Remember, it is the combination of both the FPS and support system specification, that contains the complete set of system requirements satisfying the user needs described in the OCD. The capability life cycle consists of four discrete phases. If you look towards the top of the slide, you can observe that the four phases include, a strategy and concepts phase, a risk mitigation and requirement setting phase, and acquisition phase, and finally, and in-service and disposal phase. Overlaid on top of this process, is an agreed government approval pathway comprising three distinct gates, being, gate 0, gate 1 and gate 2. The capability need, and initial justification for a project, 
is laid out at a high level during the strategy and concepts phase. At the conclusion of this phase, a business case overview, supported by a joint capability needs statement and project execution strategy, including initial cost estimates are agreed at the investment committee. This approval provides entry for the capability into the Defense Integrated Investment Program. This process, then repeats itself, with increasing levels of information fidelity and confidence. As a new capability proposal moves through the approval pathway at gates 1 and 2. You can see on the slide, that there are a range of capability and acquisition processes, underpinning the detailed development of key capability proposal documents, at each stage. Following the successful source selection of a material system during the acquisition phase, industry is contracted to deliver particular products, satisfying specified technical requirements and the user need. Remember, it is a deliberate planning and project management process that progressively expands the definition of the required capability, including the necessary project and technical scope, schedules, supporting milestones and costs. Also remember, much of this information will be provided in due course by the acquisition organization and industry. Without diving into unnecessary detail at this point, I would like to highlight that it is a project's work breakdown structure, or WBS, that brings great clarity to a project's scope, schedule and costs, that I have just discussed. The Capability Life Cycle Governance Framework is divided into three levels as shown on this slide. At the portfolio level, Head Force Design is delegated the Joint Force Design Authority, and is responsible for designing and developing the key force design documents, including the Master Capability Program and Capability Program Directives. Force Design Division also consolidates all the program strategies into a force design for the Joint Force. At the portfolio level, the capability program architecture consists of five domains, that is, maritime, land, air, space, and information and cyber. At the program level, there are 36 capability programs, with 10 of these spanning all of the capability domains. Below the portfolio and program level, there is the project level. I will discuss the relationship between the program and project level in more detail in the next slide. Defense capabilities are delivered within a program and project framework as shown on this slide. To the left of the red line, you can observe the key capability documents underpinning the definition of a new capability system. At the program level, these include, the capability program narrative, and program operational concept. It is these two documents that inform the development of individual project joint capability narrative statements, or JCNS, and operational concept documents, or OCDs. Importantly, it is the program operational concept that outlines the key functionality of the capability system. It is these high-level, capability system functional requirements, that are used to inform the allocation of key functional requirements to the individual projects, such as Project A, B and C shown on the slide. You can see on the slide, that sitting behind each project OCD, is a companion FPS. Let's now move across to the right hand side of the red line, and into the program and project area of the framework. It is here, under the umbrella of a program, that individual projects sit. Each project, with their own unique and distinctive project's scope, schedule, cost and risk profile, is charged to deliver the government-approved products and services. So, as you can see on the slide, it is the project that delivers the required products, that in turn, need to satisfy the levels of functionality and performance specified in each project's FPS. You can also see on the diagram that there are linkages between the projects and the products. These linkages represent interfaces between the different projects and products, and identifying and documenting these interfaces, form an important part of early capability definition. For each individual project, it is possible that there could be thousands, or even, tens of thousands of products required to be delivered by a project. It is the work breakdown structure, as previously mentioned, that documents and describes all the products to be delivered by a project. 
So, this thing described as a work breakdown structure, turns out to be a pivotal artifact developed during the planning process. The VCDF is the Joint Force Authority, and accountable for Joint Force Interoperability, supported by the Head Force Integration. The VCDF is also the Chair of the Investment Committee, and accountable for approval of the Gate Zero, 1 and 2 business cases. Following this approval, capability proposals can then be submitted to the Defense Committee. The capability managers are assigned programs by the Joint Force Authority. They are responsible for developing capability proposals within assigned capability programs, and ensuring the integration of Joint Force interoperability requirements. They develop the program strategy, joint capability needs statements, and business case, supported by the acquisition organization. The capability manager supports the development of the project execution strategy, by the acquisition organization. The program sponsor is accountable to the capability manager for requirement setting, including all fundamental inputs to capability, and interoperability considerations. They contribute to program and project planning, in partnership with the acquisition organization. The program sponsor takes carriage for development of the business case on behalf of the capability manager. They also chair the project steering groups up until project approval by government at gate 2. Let's now look briefly at the key committees within the capability life cycle, and their key functions and focus. The three key committees include the investment committee, the capability manager gate review, or CMGR, and the program and project steering groups. The investment committee, chaired by the vice chief of the defense force, is the strategic level committee within the capability governance framework. It is primarily focused on ensuring that new capability proposals sit correctly within the integrated investment program, in accordance with strategic guidance and agreed portfolio level funding profiles. Investment committee approval is required before any capability proposal is submitted to government, as part of a project's agreed approval pathway. Entry of a capability proposal into the integrated investment program occurs as part of a routine biannual update process. To ensure whole of government input, representatives of Prime Minister and Cabinet, and the Department of Finance, are represented at the investment committee. The Capability Manager Gate Review, or CMGR, is chaired by the respective service chief, and individual program and project steering groups, sit within the Capability Program architecture. At this level, the Capability Manager, Program Sponsor, and Program Manager within the Acquisition Organization, are responsible for developing and endorsing the key project level artifacts. These include, individual project business cases, project execution strategies, cost estimates, and the supporting operational concept document and material system function and performance specification. They will also consider, amongst other things, specific project arrangements including resourcing, scheduling, costs, and risk profiles, prior to submission to the investment committee. Project initiation for a new capability concludes with approval of the Gate Zero capability proposal by the investment committee. At this point, the capability proposal now gains access into the integrated investment program. So, Gate Zero therefore represents the culmination of early staff work, and provides the decision milestone and direction to the capability manager, to proceed with further development of the capability proposal during the risk mitigation and requirements setting phase. The key document for development during this phase is the business case overview. It is developed by the capability manager, and summarizes the key aspects of the joint capability needs statement, and the project execution strategy. Development direction for the capability proposal is contained in the capability program directive, issued by the joint force authority, to the capability manager. At the center of the documents shown on the screen, you can see the business case overview. At its core, the business case provides the justification for undertaking an investment in a new capability. It evaluates the benefits, costs and risk of alternative options, 
and provides a rationale for a preferred solution. At a broader level, it represents the totality of staff work to date, and summarizes the key information contained in the Joint Capability Needs Statement, the Project Execution Strategy, and a First Cost Estimate. You will note that I have also included a draft operational concept document. In order to develop broad options for government consideration, it would be necessary as a minimum to have completed some analysis within Sections 3 and 5 of the OCD. In particular, it is Section 5 that provides the preliminary analysis into the potential solution classes that can satisfy the capability need. Once the Investment Committee has agreed to a capabilities inclusion in the Integrated Investment Program at Gate Zero, staff work now shifts to the development of a detailed capability proposal and business case. The tailoring of a capability proposal's approval pathway occurs during the strategy and concepts phase, and may have resulted in a decision for a new project to proceed directly to Gate 2. While such an outcome is entirely possible, it is unlikely to occur for complex and high-value projects. The reason for this, is that complex projects require considerable staff work to properly analyze and scope a project's work, risk and costs. To support this significantly increased workload, an integrated project management team will be established towards the end of Gate Zero, or very early in the risk mitigation and requirements setting phase. The key documents to be developed by the capability and acquisition staff for Gates 1 and 2 consideration are shown on the slide. Work now swings into gear to develop the operational concept document, a function and performance specification, and other project management related plans. The detailed work undertaken in these three key documents will allow the next iteration of the project cost estimate. The total scope and work estimate for the project, as mentioned earlier, is captured in the work breakdown structure which forms part of the project management and the other key technical plans. The integrated project management plan is the key project management document that describes how a project is going to be delivered, what it's going to deliver, when it's going to deliver those products, and how much it's going to cost, including the expenditure profile. Of course, the project management plan also includes a risk management section, which is usually based on a separate risk management plan. A well-developed project management plan is fundamental to the successful delivery of a new capability. Besides the project management plan, the other key companion documents that need to be developed include a systems engineering management plan, a test and evaluation master plan, and an integrated logistic support plan. Depending on the complexity of the project, there could be many other additional supporting plans required to supplement the project management plan, systems engineering management plan, and integrated logistic support plan. The hard part of developing the project management plan, is to come up with a truly integrated plan, that brings together the often competing needs and priorities of the technical and logistics programs. Now, as I'm sure you can appreciate, all of these individual plans within a project generate their own work scope and associated risks. The primary way to get your mind around this very large volume of work, is through the careful preparation and use of work breakdown structures. So, in the next section of the lesson, I will turn my attention to explaining to you, at a high level, about the fundamental importance of the work breakdown structure, and the role it plays in project planning. Let's now take a few moments to develop an understanding of some of the key terminology that I will use throughout the remainder of the course. A capability system is a specific combination of the fundamental inputs to capability, used as the primary management framework for the development and delivery of an endorsed level of operational capability. The material system is a combination of the mission system and the support system. The material system is defined by the system requirements contained in the function and performance specification, and the support system specification. A work breakdown structure is a product-oriented family tree, which is used to plan the design, development and production of a material system, including all the management-related products. 
The WBS defines and structures all the products needed to satisfy the overall project objectives. Products include both component products and deliverables services. An integrated project schedule is a timed based and sequenced representation of all the products contained in a project's work breakdown structure. The integrated project schedule is used to identify the sequence and timing of product delivery, milestones and the project's critical path. A resource estimate is an estimate in current day dollars of all the human resources, including contractor services, needed to deliver a project, and finally. A cost estimate is an estimate of the total cost to develop, acquire, operate, sustain, and dispose of a capability. Cost estimates are developed based on a project's work breakdown structure. During the previous slide, I introduced you to the definition of a work breakdown structure. You will recall that the WBS is a product-oriented family tree of all the products and delivered services needed to satisfy a project's objectives. But at a deeper level, the WBS provides an invaluable planning tool used to divide a project into manageable pieces of work. The process of decomposition of all the products and delivered services is fundamental to the planning and control of cost, schedule, and technical work. Based on my experience, I can't understate the importance of a good work breakdown structure to support the successful delivery of a project. The other aspect that I would like you to understand is that the WBS provides the fundamental building blocks for the design, development and delivery of the mission system, which is fundamentally driven by the system's engineering process. So, when you are developing your project's WBS, it is essential that you get detailed input from your engineering and logistic support staff. You can also clearly see on the slide that the WBS provides the fundamental inputs into the development of the integrated project schedule, the project resource estimate, and the capability systems cost estimate. It is simply not possible to develop these three important artifacts without a properly developed WBS. Now that you understand a work breakdown structure is a fundamental building block of a project, we can use the information contained within the WBS to develop an integrated project schedule. The integrated schedule represents a logical and time-based sequencing of a project's work packages. The diagram on the slide provides a view of a project schedule using what is called a Gantt chart. This is probably the most common schedule view used in project scheduling. The other representation of a schedule that you may see from time to time is what is known as a PERT chart or network diagram. PERT charts are very useful in determining a project's critical path. Given the significant complexity associated with modern projects it is essential to use modern project scheduling tools, such as, Primavera, Open Plan Professional, or for less complex projects, Microsoft Project. These tools can easily provide a broad range of important information relating to a project's critical path, resource peaks and costs. Over the years, I have used these tools to good effect in managing projects between millions of dollars, through to many hundreds of millions of dollars. Break time equals 1.5s, greater than. Another important part of project planning is estimating the project resources needed to deliver the project scope as defined in the WBS. Again, as you can see on this slide, the WBS is used to allocate work to the project team. Remember, the WBS includes all internal, as well as, external work. It is therefore important to identify contract resources, as part of your integrated project team structure. The project resource estimate is usually developed using an iterative approach. Over the years, I found it useful to use both a top-down and bottom-up approach to resource estimating. The bottom-up approach is based on making a work effort allocation against all the resources, both internal and external, that will be working on the products contained in the work breakdown structure. All this work is then summed to arrive at a grand total in either hours, days, months, or years of work effort. The alternate method, based on a top-down approach, starts with a first best guess based on experience, 
of the number of internal and contract staff needed within the integrated project team. An estimate is made of the duration that each resource is required based on the integrated project schedule, resulting in a rolled-up resource estimate. It is then possible to compare the resource estimate based on the top-down and bottom-up approaches. Depending on the level of difference between the two estimates, further iteration of the work efforts allocated against products, or durations against resources, may need to be undertaken. The cost breakdown structure, or CBS, is based on the detailed work undertaken to develop the WBS and project resource estimate. In fact, the cost breakdown structure mirrors the hierarchical, product oriented, work breakdown structure. This means that if the WBS has been developed in Excel, then it is a reasonably straightforward process to develop the supporting cost breakdown structure. The CBS, because it is based on the WBS, provides a fully traceable and logic-based method for developing a sound cost estimate, covering a project's acquisition and through life support costs. For defense projects, the work breakdown structure and cost breakdown structure are developed using the Defense Cost Template Workbook, which provides a detailed and structured set of worksheets covering the acquisition and through life support phases of the project. This issue, and the use of the cost template, will be explored in more detail later in the course. As you proceed on the journey to develop the key capability proposal documents needed to support capability definition and acquisition, thoughtful risk management is used to identify and mitigate key project risks. A well-developed and executed risk management program is central to a project achieving its goal and key objectives. As one proceeds through the risk management process, its outputs are often used to develop contingent products that are included in a project's work breakdown structure. In addition to this, it is common to see a risk breakdown structure, or RBS, developed in parallel with the project's WBS. Remember, the process of risk management, at the end of the day, is really all about having a plan B. In my long career as a senior project manager, I often had to fall back onto my plan B contingent work products, in order to reorient a project when it was in trouble. As we progressed through this lesson, we have spent some time considering the capability proposal development process and the importance of the work breakdown structure as part of the project planning process. But an important extension to this work, which I unfortunately can't explore in any detail, relates to the importance of having a well understood capability design framework and supporting process. Such a framework is essential in developing a very clear understanding of the operational use of a new capability system and the resulting user needs. It is also needed to develop a well-crafted operational concept document, and the supporting function and performance specifications, that contain a project's system technical requirements. To further your knowledge in this area, you may wish to undertake a professional development course that covers this essential content matter in more detail. Now having set the scene to the key elements of the project planning process, you are probably wondering what the actual role of the desk officer is in the greater scheme of things. So, based on my experience as a desk officer many years ago, I thought I'd share my thoughts with you. Firstly, you need to have divine foresight and be able to anticipate every risk and twist and turn in a project life. You need to be able to juggle a dozen balls at the same time, and of course, deliver outstanding capability proposal documents with next to no resources. Because of your divine foresight, you will be able to forecast project costs and milestones with absolute pinpoint accuracy, while maintaining gymnast-like flexibility in a turbulent sea of changing priorities, 24-7. Of course, this is a light-hearted view of the role of the desk officer, but as you move through your journey, I'm sure you will come to appreciate some of the finer points of my experience. Let's now look briefly at some of the problems commonly encountered in delivering complex projects. Take a few moments now to read through the list on the slide. The first point, and an issue that occurs far too frequently, 
relates to the inadequate front-end definition of the capability system. This issue, along with not spending sufficient time to define precisely what success looks like, are commonly discussed in the literature dealing with project failures, or projects that have failed to deliver as planned. So, it is absolutely essential that adequate time be made available to correctly, and adequately develop a project's work breakdown structure. The last point fundamentally relates to poor change control once a project is underway. The root cause of this problem often lies in inadequate work during the early phases of the capability design process. This results in missed user needs that naturally emerge once the detailed design process is underway. These changes lead to scope creep and inevitable cost and schedule overruns. So, as I discussed earlier, it is essential to have a well-developed capability design framework that you can use in parallel with the project planning processes. To give you a real-life example of what can go wrong in large projects, the short video clip drawn from Pentagon Wall shown in the next section provides a light-hearted, but quite serious account of what went wrong during the development of the US Bradley fighting vehicle. My own personal experience from working on large defense projects is not entirely dissimilar. Ladies and gentlemen, if I can have your attention, please, if you'd all just take your seats. Thank you. We are pleased to present a scale model of the new Bradley fighting vehicle. to carry 11 Bradley is outfitted with the most sophisticated surveillance equipment ever developed it is also equipped with a rapid-fire cannon and an anti-tank rocket launcher which means it's loaded with 1500 shells and 10 tow anti-tank missiles so in summation gentlemen what you have before you is a troop transport that can't carry troops a reconnaissance vehicle that's too conspicuous to do reconnaissance. And a quasi-tank that has less armor than a snowblower, but has enough ammo to take out half of DC. Fantastic. Congratulations, General Smith. General? Hell of a job. General. Let's build it. They're building it? This is what we're building? I have listed on this slide a number of important references that I have used in preparing this course. I would commend all of them to you, if you require further information about any particular topic, relating to project planning or the application of the One Defense Capability Model to defense projects. In the final section of this lesson, I will provide you with a short overview of the remaining course content. During lesson one of the course, I introduced you to the key concepts underpinning project planning and cost estimating. In lesson two, I will go into greater detail about the project planning process, and the detailed use and application of work breakdown structures. Following this, lessons three and four, focus on key issues that you should be aware of relating to project scheduling, and the role of risk management within the planning process. During lessons 5 and 6, I will introduce you to the basics of cost estimating and the use of the capability cost template to support artifact development at gates 0, 1, and 2.
So to sum up, the aim of this course is to provide you with a good understanding of the fundamental project planning processes and use of the Defense Cost Template Workbook to assist you in your work as a project desk officer. This brings us to the end of Lesson 1. I trust you have enjoyed the introduction to project planning and cost estimating. I now invite you to review the learning material and complete the quizzes.